Hello and welcome to the launch of the 2023 Lowy Institute Asia Power Index. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Institute. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Since we began publishing the Asia Power Index in 2018, it's become one of the Institute's crown jewels, along with the Lowy Institute poll and our aid maps. It's the most credible resource for measuring national power in our region. In fact, there's nothing quite like the Asia Power Index anywhere in the world. The index is of its time. A quarter of a century ago, the idea that we would need to measure power might have seemed like a vestige of a past period. But today, as Washington and Beijing jostle for global leadership, as tanks once again roll through Europe, as the use of nuclear weapons unfortunately seems a greater possibility than in recent times, the post-Cold War holiday is well and truly over. Power matters, and so we must understand power. The Asia Power Index ranks 26 countries and territories on their resources and what they do with their resources. It reaches west to Pakistan, north to Russia, south to New Zealand and east to the United States. The 2023 edition of the index, which covers five years of data, is the most comprehensive assessment of the changing distribution of power in Asia assembled to date. I want to acknowledge all the work that my Lowy Institute colleagues have put into this year's API. Susanna Patton, Jack Sato, Hervé Lemahieu, Claire Caldwell, Shane McLeod, Ian Bruce, and many others who supported this project all deserve enormous praise for what they've achieved. And with me today to discuss the 2023 edition of the Index, We have Susanna Patton, our Program Director for Southeast Asia and also the lead author of the 2023 Index. Welcome, Susanna. And an old friend and institute stalwart, Hervé Lemahieu, the Research Director of the Institute and the researcher who first devised the Index methodology back for the first edition of the the Index. Welcome, Hervé. Thanks, Michael. All right. What I'm going to do today is ask Hervé and Susanna about this year's Index we, we will put up on the screen some graphs and some statistics that, showing how, and that show how the power balance has changed in the last five years. Susanna, let me kick off with you. First of all, congratulations on your first index. What are the big takeaways from this year's findings? Thanks, Michael. Well, I think the big takeaways are the fact that China really struggled during the COVID pandemic to maintain its power with its power and influence with other countries in Asia. So we saw that in terms of China's connectivity, thinking about its connections between people, between businesses, even the flow of capital into and out of China all slowed down remarkably during the pandemic period. And so what that meant is that the United States was really able to retain the top position that it's had in the power index over the last uh, five years. Um, And in fact, this year, the United States, States actually leads China on six out of eight of the measures of power that we use in the Asia Power Index. Okay, so... US is number one. China has suffered a little bit because of COVID zero and other factors. What are the other big conclusions? So one of the other big findings is that the region's middle powers are doing less well than many people might hope or expect. So working with countries like India and Japan is a key element of US Indo-Pacific strategy. But what the Asia Power Index shows is that both of those countries face major challenges in terms of their power in Asia. So in India's case, it's about its influence being quite limited in South Asia and India having relatively weak economic engagement with the rest of Asia. And in Japan's case, it's about long-term structural decline, meaning that it's becoming a relatively less economic partner for many countries in Asia, so in terms of trade and investment. 
And then at the same time, of course, Japan is trying to establish itself as a more prominent regional security actor, but that's not happening fast enough to compensate for that loss of economic influence. So from the perspective of Australia and the United States, that, that should be a kind of concerning message because we need to be asking ourselves what role are India and Japan going to be playing in the Indo-Pacific? Let me ask you about other rankings. I mean, in general, the rankings in the index are pretty consistent from year to year. Why is that? And is there anything you've noticed this year? Is there anything interesting on rankings? So I think the rankings, of course, reflect countries' resources as well as their influence. And that tends to be fairly stable over time. Although, of course, there have been some changes like last year, Indonesia entering the top 10, for example. One thing that I think many people will be interested in is why Russia ranks as highly as it does. So Russia is ranked as the fifth most powerful country in Asia. And what that really reflects is Russia's military strength and also a legacy of defence relationships with countries in Asia. But of course, we know that in the wake of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine, it's going to really struggle to rebuild its military capability and also maintain some of those defence relationships. So I think that's something that we could see change in future years. What about perceptions of Russian weakness arising from um, the poor performance of the Russian military in Ukraine. I mean, that may not reflect in this year's index, but over time, would that plus the distraction factor, the fact that, that it's an existential conflict for Russia, will that make it harder to focus on the Indo-Pacific? For sure. And I think one of the things we can already say from this edition of the Asia Power Index is that Russia's diplomatic influence took a big hit. And what that reflects is the perception that Russia is not really going to be as engaged as perhaps it once might have been in Asia. So that's something we can already see. Hervé, let me bring you in. You've been involved in the index now for more than five years. Um, what are your sort of long-term observations over those five years? What, are, what have been the big shifts, the big surprises for you over the last half decade? Yeah, well, the, the great privilege of no longer being in the trenches, as, as, so to speak, after, after five years and, um, and, and seeing the index take a life of its own in, in the capable hands of, of uh, Susanna and, and Jack, is that you can now stand back a little bit, um, uh, appreciate uh, the bigger view, the longer term trends. Um, and it, I mean, there are a number of surprises. Even the fact that the rankings don't change as often as we expected they would is a surprise. Uh, the fact is that power is, I mean, it's like tectonic sh uh, plates that are slowly shifting and uh, it doesn't uh, shift uh, as quickly as some in the media might portray. That in itself is already uh, noteworthy. Uh, when we launched the API in 2018, what made it so interesting and alarming to those in Washington who we briefed at the time, uh, Michael, um, was that we had basically proven um, that uh, China had breached US primacy, that the, the balloon of US primacy had popped. Um, uh, and in the academic literature, uh, any uh, uh, emerging power that basically breaches a threshold of 80% of the established powers um, uh, uh, overall standing um, triggers a power transition. So that was what we were witnessing in 2018. Since then, I think the biggest surprise has been of China's halting progress in uh, becoming America's true equal. So it's a near peer competitor. It's, it's not a complete peer competitor. And in fact, China has many weaknesses, as does the United States. Both seem rather hobbled um, and locked into this uh, uh, unequal struggle between superpowers with no decisive uh, winner. Uh, and this may well be the uh, reality we have to deal with in, in not only coming years, but perhaps decades. Uh, we're not seeing either party uh, likely to be able to break free of the other. So bipolarity is the name of the game. Um, it's not uh, particularly stable. Neither uh, of these countries appear content uh, with the existence of the other um, for the moment. And whether that results in uh, outright conflict or uh, uh, some form of settling point down the road is the big concern of the day. But in the meantime, the rest of us have to get on uh, with, uh, with our own uh, uh, strategy and geopolitics um, in the region. Uh, and despite what uh, Susanna says, um, uh, 
uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely true to say we have not seen evidence of a more multipolar distribution mm. in Asia. That's the biggest, uh, the second biggest surprise, um, if I can put it that way. Uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about a concert of powers, about uh, a region dominated by not just the US and China, but at least three or more uh, major powers. Uh, and the fact that the gulf between China and the next most important players has only widened in those five years suggests to me that that's not the case, that's not happening. Um, but there is a form of asymmetric advantage that third players still wield uh, in a situation where neither the US nor China can really claim undisputed primacy. Um, uh, and that is to say that we're enormously important to both Beijing and Washington's calculations. And in so far as we can exploit that, um, and many countries do in, in different ways, um, uh, we still have a role to play within the overall balance of power. And not only that, but within the overall character of the regional order, if I can, if I can put it that way. So the fact is, Southeast Asia is still remarkably uh, uh, diplomatically dynamic, uh, as is uh, Indonesia. Uh, despite the fact that these are countries which are uh, non-aligned between US and China, or perhaps because of that fact. Um, uh, Australia, also uh, an incredibly networked power uh, with a seat at the table uh, with India, Japan, uh, and the United States in terms of the Quad, uh, the, the major democracies fringing the Indo-Pacific, but we're also plugged into Southeast Asia, and of course, we're a resident power in the South Pacific. So that means that we've got uh, our uh, tentacles in, in, in many of these uh, smaller coalitions that are forming. It's not a grand concert of powers. It's a much messier reality. Uh, but uh, network power is uh, absolutely influential in, in how uh, the, the, the overall picture is shaping up. I want to come back to the rest of the region, but let me focus, let me stay on the United States and China just for a bit, because as you say, one of the big insights out of five years of the index findings is that there is still blue water between the United States and China and, and the rest of us. Um, Susanna, on the United States, talk to it, tell us a little bit more about its performance over the past year. I was a bit surprised because I've been impressed by, the, by Biden's foreign policy, by the the adroit way that they've managed um, the the war in Ukraine by their their alliance management in our part of the world, I thought that they might have had a more positive result than they have. Whereas the way you phrase their performance is more that the Chinese have not sort of the the Chinese have allowed the United States to remain at the top rather than the United States has had a great year. Is that is that is that a fair assessment of, of your take? I think so. I mean, I think the US and China each have one overwhelming advantage in Asia. For the US, it's the defence and security ties, and for China, it's the economic relationships. Where the contest is potentially more interesting is in terms of diplomatic influence. And there, China narrowly overtook the US to take the top spot for that measure in this year's power index. Why I think that is, is because China's approach to the region tends to be focused on a very broad outreach with a very wide group of countries. So even just thinking about the travel that we saw last year from China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, he visited many, many countries in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, whereas by contrast, the US Secretary of State is focused on deep alliances and partnerships with fewer partners. So the US has made great progress with Japan, with Australia, with the Philippines. But if you were to make a judgment about their relationship with other countries in the region, the picture is often a bit less compelling. So I think it's that difference in strategy, which is why China took out that top spot for diplomatic influence. Yeah, and just to add two things to, to what Susanna is saying. I mean, the first is it's remarkable that China was able to do that, to, to, to basically retake the number one spot for diplomatic influence at a time when it was under uh, COVID zero lockdown mm -hmm. uh, from the rest of the world. So uh, that implies that China is still very competitive, um, does place huge emphasis on a high level diplomatic engagement. So it may not be the, the people to people ties that we are tracking in terms of economic influence, um, but it's certainly, and cultural influence, but it's certainly the high elite level of diplomacy that China still prevails. And that's in contrast with the Biden's, uh, uh, the Biden administration's um, own track record in Asia. It's not just um, that uh, th they are focusing on on, on deeper 
narrower alliance relationships, but um, it is the fact that globally the U.S. was ranked as as being the most effective player diplomatically, but regionally mm. um, it languishes in ninth place. Um, so there is a disjuncture between uh, the U.S.'s global image and profile, particularly in light of uh, the successes it has had in terms of supporting Ukraine against Russia and uh, its uh, record here in Asia over the last 12 months. Hervé, one of the signs of the prestige the index has acquired over the last five years is the attentiveness to it that we see from index countries. So um, diplomats from index countries are always asking Susanna and, and me and others in the lead up how their country is likely to do. Um, they're very alert um, to the results when they come out. They skite about positive results. They grumble about negative results. You've mentioned China. What has been the response from China since the index was released earlier this week? Well, the broader response has been that we've always found that they've been very curious uh, about um, our assessment and and eager to compare notes with their own uh, assessments of comprehensive national power. So in the pre-pandemic days, before the deterioration in bilateral ties with Australia, I mean, we would travel to China and we would find that um, officials and analysts would pore over our uh, index in minute detail. Uh, they would ask uh, really targeted uh, uh, questions. They were always a bit mercurial about um, about the findings. I remember in the pre-Wolf Warrior days, they thought we were exaggerating China's mm. power um, as a way of making a point about its regional ambitions. But of course, uh, in the 2023 index, now that their power has taken a bit of a dip as a result of uh, the secondary consequences of its handling of COVID, um, uh, we've we've seen some reports in the Global Times, or one report really, uh, uh, with with some grumbles around the veracity of our data. Now, the the point about our data is that it's basically the same metrics year in year out applied consistently to all countries since 2018, and that is the best defense. Uh, because in 2020, the Chinese state-owned media was uh, lining up for interviews uh, about how well China had done relative to how poorly the U.S. was doing with its handling of the, of the pandemic. So you do have to sort of take these things um, in your stride. Um, and as you say, it, it is at least uh, at a very minimum an indicator of the fact that we are closely read, not only in Beijing, but I think in D.C. also and in many capitals in between. Let me stay with you, Hervé, for a minute and ask you about um, demography. Uh, how big a, a force is democ demography in determining the national power of countries and how, what kind of impact is it having in countries like China and Japan? Mm. Look, I mean, the familiar refrain is that demography is destiny. Um, and, and in fact, much of Asia's economic transformation and success over the last 20 years owes uh, uh, to the fact that there's been an enormous demographic dividend in this region, a dividend that is now uh, starting to dry up a little bit. Um, uh, certainly a lot of East Asia, but even parts of Southeast Asia are starting to age uh, and uh, their workforces uh, are beginning to decline. And in some places that's been ongoing for a while, like Japan, uh, and in others, uh, we've just reached that cusp. Um, so in China, for example, that will really accelerate between now in 2050, I think they're going to lose uh, something like 200 million people from their workforce. The working age population will decline by around a fifth between 2020 and 2050, which is absolutely drastic and, and is bound to have an impact. Um, by contrast, uh, I think uh, there are countries like Australia, I mean, really only one or two countries in the world that are both rich and growing their working age population. Normally, you're rich and you are aging. Uh, for China, it's the worst of both worlds. It's uh, that you are still uh, not yet rich and aging, uh, growing, growing old before you become rich. Um, uh, and in other cases, like in Indonesia and in India, these countries can expect if they uh, you know, use their working age populations productively uh, to reap the benefits from that. But there is a delay uh, on, on, uh, on, on a growth in a population by itself is not going to ensure that you're going to be doing better on the international stage. A lot of developing countries, for example, might be growing, but they still have a very low per capita GDP. Their priorities are overwhelmingly domestic and to do with the development of their economy and the welfare of their societies and, and eliminating poverty. That distracts in some ways or detracts from the bandwidth that they can 
really dedicate to foreign policy and strategy. Um, and in India's case as well, it's not a given that um, that uh, a, a youth bulge will result in a demographic dividend. You know that really requires that your economy continues to grow and that it's capable of absorbing. Um, uh, uh, the youth in, in productive ways um, rather than uh, in terms of chronic uh, underemployment, which in other parts of the world, like the uh, Middle East, uh, we saw the Arab Spring largely fermented by uh, chronically underemployed youth. And so there is a political risk there. If you don't manage uh, a, a growth in your population well, it can actually be a source of political instability and detract from your power. Susanna, let me draw you out further on Japan and India. Um, those are countries that uh, Washington and Canberra and other Western capitals are hoping will become more powerful, will help to fill the space, complicate the region, make it harder for it to be dominated by one big state in the form of China. But, but as you mentioned earlier, the index sounds a bit of a note of caution here. So tell us a bit more about India and Japan, and perhaps you can tell us what would India and, and Japan, what should they be doing differently in order to maximise their power? Mm. Well, they're both very different, of course, mm -hmm. as you know, so I'll, I'll talk about them separately. I think India, first of all, of course, we have to acknowledge it's just its size, its weight, its population, as Hervé has alluded to, means that it will be a really important force in the Indo-Pacific and it is a key part of US strategy. Australia as well has been developing its ties with India a lot in recent years. But and India performs pretty well in terms of diplomatic influence, um, but in other areas it's relatively weak. So especially in terms of economic relationships, it's not well integrated with the rest of Asia. It's not part of big trade agreements mm -hmm. like the CPTPP. Um, and its foreign ministry also in terms of diplomatic capacity is also still not rated mm. as one of the top foreign ministries in our region. So that does hold India back. And interestingly, what we've also seen in this edition of the Power Index is evidence that India is actually losing influence in its own neighbourhood. So we've seen that reflected prominently in the case of Sri Lanka, where China has become a more important economic partner. But it's also true in some other countries in South Asia as well. In the case of Japan, of course, it's talking about different factors. Um, Japan faces long-term structural economic slowdown, which means that, relatively speaking, it's a less important source of foreign investment and trade for countries in Asia. And that was really highlighted um, last year when we saw Japan uh, Japan lose its spot that it's had since the mid-90s as the top foreign investor in Thailand, which is a really symbolically important shift. And China, of course, accounts for most of that change. This year in the power index, Japan's military capability, I think for the first time, did increase slightly. Mm -hmm. So that shows that this efforts to implement the policies of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is bearing fruit, but it's very, very slow mm -hmm. and it's not fast enough to compensate for those declining economic relativities. What about Southeast Asia, um, which is your area of specialty where you served as an Australian diplomat. What are the most interesting findings this year for Southeast Asia? So Southeast Asia performs really well in the power index overall, given the size of the countries that we're talking about. Um, and Indonesia in particular has improved its ranking in the power index over recent years especially in terms of diplomatic influence. And what that shows is that contrary to the complaint that we sometimes hear in Australia and other countries that Indonesia isn't diplomatically active enough, actually Indonesia is one of the most diplomatically sought after countries in our region. We have new data in this year's power index that measures the number of foreign leader or foreign minister visits mm -hmm. that are hosted by each country. And Indonesia actually scored the second highest for that because it really is a country that everyone wants to visit. Mm -hmm. So that's quite important. Mm. The smaller Southeast Asian countries are a bit more of a mixed bag. Of course, we have um, a, a deep and protracted crisis in Myanmar. 
We have an economic crisis in Laos, but Cambodia and Brunei, the two recent chairs of ASEAN, have exceeded expectations and increased their, their power in the Asia Power Index. All right, one more question for you, Susanna. Let me ask you about Australia, um, seeing as we're sitting in Australia. Um, tell us about Australia's diplomatic influence. Obviously, we have a new government that's put a particular focus on Southeast Asia. Um, we also have seen um, ministers and a prime minister who's very involved in personal diplomacy. We remember Mr Albanese on the plane to Tokyo for the Quad meeting within minutes apparently of being sworn in. And of course, the foreign minister has visited many Pacific Island countries and Southeast Asian countries. How has that been reflected in the index this year? And what kind of uh, performance has Australia had in 2023? It's definitely true to say that the Albanese government's approach to Asia has resulted in Australia's diplomatic influence increasing in the Asia Power Index as compared to the last edition, which was, of course, measuring the performance of the Morrison government. So the experts that we surveyed for the Asia Power Index saw the Albanese government as having a better approach to prosecuting Australia's interests in Asia. Australia also has kind of long-term advantages in mm. terms of its power in Asia. Um, that's because of many of the factors that Hervé talked about, the fact that we're a wealthy country, but also with a favourable demographic outlook. And that means that Australia is actually the only middle power to come out of the three pandemic years with a power score that is close to what it had going into the pandemic. All of the regions, other major countries, really suffered big setbacks and Australia was the exception there. Hervé, one of the big changes since um, we last put the index out is has been the thawing in relations between um, Beijing and Canberra, with both sides mm. taking tentative steps um, towards resuming dialogue and, of course, meetings at, at different levels, including at the leaders level. What does that tell us about how power is changing in Asia? Look, I, I think it tells us that China is recalibrating um, uh, and that's a bigger picture than just Australia. I think uh, it realised somehow, somewhere within Beijing, they must have done a similar assessment to our own and realize that um, uh, the combination of self-imposed isolation as a result of COVID, uh, as well as the wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, was creating some very negative secondary consequences on China's image. Um, and of course, uh, so that's the big picture. Um, uh, and then of course, a change of government in Australia with, with a slightly you know, more nuanced um, rhetoric, more disciplined, I'd say, more professional, um, uh, created an opportunity. And so, uh, uh, Australia sees that opportunity. Of course, we we, we should have, um, and uh, I think the there are dividends for both sides in having a more professional, less fraught, less fraught, more, more normal day to day relationship. There may be limitations in terms of how far that goes, um, but there are also uh, secondary dividends for Australia in terms of what it does in terms of normalising our our image. We're no longer seen as quite the same outlier we were uh, a year ago. Uh, it's less easy for China to typecast Australia as an anti-China crusader. Um, uh, and that uh, has an impact in terms of how we're perceived uh, abroad, not just in Beijing, but actually among non-aligned third countries in, for example, Southeast Asia or even the Pacific. So you do have to think about the peripheral vision here. It's not just about the tunnel vision fixation on, on, on China. Um, and um, and it has resulted in, in Australia's diplomatic influence uh, uh, trending up uh, as a result of what's happened in the last uh, few months. Now, I in terms of the, 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 the broader picture, I, I think a lot of Australians will be surprised that we do as well as we do. I mean, there is a sort of persistent and as a... As an immigrant to Australia, now a naturalized Australian citizen, I've always been surprised by this uh, strain of self-doubt uh, uh, in the Australian strategic community um, uh, in terms of our own capacities, this sort of belief that we're a shrinking middle power, that we will uh, soon be a, a minnow in Asia surrounded by uh, these huge emerging giants. And that hasn't quite um, happened at all. Uh, in fact, we're, we're very durable, quite competitive. Um, we have a lot of advantages and cards to play, um, uh, but we do need to have a finer appraisal, not only of our own power and the versatility uh, of, our, of our influence, uh, but also of what's happening uh, 
uh, in the region more widely. Ultimately, the value of the index is not just to illustrate how US-China competition is playing out, uh, but uh, to showcase the importance of the broader context in which that takes place. Uh, the ecosystem matters, and we need to have a much better uh, peripheral vision of the roles, interests, uh, actions, choices of every other country, Asia's long tail of middle powers, in order to be able to maximize our position. Let, let me push you a bit more on Australia, though. Um, both of you have spoken about Australia's um, structural advantages um, and the fact that Australia is actually closing on Russia in terms of its uh, n comprehensive power in Asia, even though Russia is a Security Council member, a former superpower, a nuclear weapons power, and so on. Um, you've talked about seeing through the, the sort of strain of self-doubt, and you've also spoken about um, some diplomatic successes in the last year. What does the index reveal about the weaknesses of Australia in terms of its power? And let me put the same question that I put to you earlier about Japan and India. Apart from getting a, having a finer appreciation for for um, diplomacy and foreign policy in Asia, what should Australia be looking at to try to lock in mm. uh, its structural advantages and further maximise its national power? Yeah, we, we can't be too complacent. Um, we are the lucky country, and one of the reasons why we've emerged from the pandemic unscathed is also simply the fact that we have this incredible resource wealth, the commodity-led exports have powered us through uh, uh, this downturn in the global economy, uh, but uh, also uh, is the fact that we remain very engaged within the, the rules-based trading system. Um, uh, the fact is we were able to find alternative markets. Trade diversion uh, was our salvation, our economic resilience uh, in light of those economic sanctions or restrictions rather from China. Uh, and yet, if the rules-based trading system or in fact anything about that system, more broadly the rules-based order, uh, starts to falter, well, Australia and every middle power um, uh, uh, will, will, will suffer as a result and disproportionately because we're not as large as, say, Indonesia or India or the United States or China. We can't just rely uh, on a domestic consumption to power ourselves through. We need to continue to engage with the world. Um, and so, yes, we, we have to think about how we can contribute to stabilizing, uh, in some sense, the regional order, the multinational system. That's not really necessarily been uh, something we thought we were capable of. Uh, you know, we've been a net beneficiary. The question is, and the challenge now, is simply uh, where can Australia play uh, that, that role and, and, and in which theatres? Um, and partly it's to do with shoring up our position in Southeast Asia. ASEAN, for all its flaws, still provides uh, a bulwark against uh, uh, great power competition, Chinese domination, uh, much more so than if it didn't exist. So, you know, we have to engage ASEAN, even though uh, we have very different views geopolitically often when it comes to our alignment with the United States or with China. Um, in the Pacific, it's, it's the opposite problem. In Southeast Asia, we have to work with and through equals. In the Pacific, we can come across as overly burdensome because we are too large uh, and are seen often uh, uh, in the critique uh, of, uh, by the Pacific of Australia as, um, uh, as imposing our own concerns on the region in terms of geopolitics. So it's really about then uh, being able to read the, the interests, the, the room a bit better in terms of addressing their own uh, existential concerns of climate change. So Susanna, Hervé's been big upping Australia. We've got to see beyond um, the persistent strain of self-doubt. We've got obviously a lot of structural advantages, but where are our weaknesses? What is the homework you would assign to Canberra if Australia wants to continue to maximise its national power? I think there are two areas where clearly Australia needs to up its game. The first is in the area of military capability. So Australia does have a relative advantage, but much less than thinking about some of the other things that we're good at like in terms of our diplomatic influence or our defence networks. So Australia is now making investments that will make our defence force more lethal, more able to hold assets at risk from a longer distance. Those things are going to be very important to maintaining that technological edge that our defence leaders say we've actually lost over recent years. So that's one area. And I think the other one is technology. Mm -hmm. One of the big lessons of Japan's relative economic decline that we track in the power index 
makes is that it's led from a loss of technological advantage. So that scenario where Australia clearly needs to improve its performance, its focus on research and development, on productivity, innovation, these are the kind of areas that will underpin Australia's future economic capability. Mm. There's also always been a bit of an asymmetry, hasn't there, between uh, Australia's performance in terms of its defence networks and defence diplomacy and its broader diplomacy. And I, and I wonder whether that's um, uh, not an indication as well of the fact that uh, sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Uh, so joining up uh, defence uh, diplomacy with uh, whatever our objectives are in terms of our regional diplomacy, that is something that we often hear, not so much in the index, it doesn't really come through in the data so much, but from the region, uh, the fact is it's almost as if uh, Australia has uh, two images and it's hard to reconcile those images. Where you might start to reconcile that image is in terms of AUKUS, not only important uh, for technology, uh, but AUKUS should be seen as, as more than just a quid pro quo uh, for keeping America in the game. Uh, but also as an opportunity to influence what kind of role America plays in this region. So sometimes we undervalue uh, our relative clout in places like DC and then fail to join the dots in terms of what that could do in terms of bolstering our position and the relative stability of the regional order uh, in Asia. So joining up the dots between the different components uh, of Australia's power, uh, I think would also be an area where we could improve. All right, last couple of questions. Hervé, um, you've been on the index journey for a number of years now. What are the really memorable moments? You've briefed it, I know, to the intelligence community in Washington, to, to all sorts of countries around the region. What are the moments that stick in your head? Yeah, well, there have been a number of uh, fairly surreal moments, I'd say, uh, in, in, in my career. Um, uh, the first, uh, you know, experience of um, briefing the White House was with, with the Trump administration in, in 2018, and um, we were sort of descending with rather bad news for them. And uh, I remember the 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 shock on at least some people's faces when they realised that um, there would be no easy return to U.S. primacy. I mean, that was uh, that was quite an interesting moment. I'm not sure how much they internalised uh, some of the other messages we were giving them. There are um, other things on their mind. Uh, that's right. But um, uh, of, of course, yes, any engagement with the uh, sort of Five Eyes intelligence community, always very interesting. We, we can't really you know, talk about that in too much detail, but suffice to say, um, th they've also been following uh, our work and it's always good to compare uh, some notes at least. Then there's a certain sort of indignation that you get from um, those that aren't included in the index, right? Mm -hmm. So as as, uh, as angry as some countries might be uh, when they've got a bad performance, um, I think worse than that is just not being included. And I remember uh, a particularly uh, strange moment uh, in probably the situation furthest removed from Asia that I can think of. This was in Davos. This was a minus you know, 15 degrees Celsius in, in the Swiss Alps. And there was a, um, a European defense minister from, from one of the larger countries uh, who came up to me and, and sort of very politely but firmly uh, suggested that Europe ought to be in the Asia Power Index. And I, I think my, my, my polite reply was to say, look, um, methodologically very challenging to add a supranational entity um, into uh, the index. Uh, but my sort of tongue-in-cheek reply was that it would undermine my Belgian neutrality as the arbiter of the index. Now, this happened to be a German, and I think that, um, you know, a German knew uh, not to escalate the matter uh, once I invoked Belgian neutrality. Um, but uh, there were other moments. Uh, uh, I mean, Narendra Modi, uh, retweet, or his office, rather, the Prime Minister of India, uh, retweeting uh, India's fourth place ranking. So, there, there, you know, there, there are fun moments when you launch an index. At the same time, it's always a certain, I always treat it with a certain degree of ambivalence, don't we? I mean, the, the, the media uh, gives it uh, its own spin. Uh, it, it, you sometimes don't have all the, the control over how, you, how they manage the, the nuance. Um, and, uh, and so then, uh, yeah, you, the nerves are always running high. And then you try to reclaim the narrative a few days later by, by writing more. Um, but we're definitely speaking to different audiences. And, and it's, it's just been a fun experience to see how this thing has has taken a life of its own. Well, Susanna, you're at the beginning of your journey with the Asia Power Index. You've come through, you've got over the first hurdle. Um, uh, 
When you look ahead at where what sort of findings the index might be producing in five years, would you like to chance your arm at how things might have changed? You've said earlier that, of course, it's quite a stable um, index overall and, and you don't get massive swings in power because we're measuring structural um, uh, factors that don't change overnight. But, but if you were to look ahead and, and make some predictions, how do you think um, the, the index might look in five years' time? Well, one thing I already mentioned is that I think Russia will be performing worse than it is now. I think a second thing is that we'll have to include Timor-Leste in the index in future with the prospect of that country joining ASEAN, mm -hmm. which I think will be a great thing because it will also help us better understand Indonesia's engagement with Timor-Leste and Indonesia is the driving force mm -hmm. behind the possibility of accession this year or in the future. Mm -hmm. And I guess a final more speculative prediction would be that I think China over time will be able to close some of the gap that it has with the United States. It hasn't really done so over the past five years, but my sense is that the pandemic restrictions were something that was holding China back. And if China's able to recalibrate, reflecting on one of some of what Hervé said about um, its decision to pull back from very confrontational relations with Australia, if China is able to recalibrate and really combine some of its strengths in Asia in terms of proximity and connectivity, then I think it's going to be a formidable, a formidable competitor to the United States. All right, so Susanna's finishing on a big prediction on China. We'll, we'll come back in five years and hold your feet to the fire and see how that turns out. Thank you, Susanna, for joining me today. Congratulations on your first index. Thank you, Hervé, for joining me and congratulations for your work on the index over the last five years. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. Of course, the Asia Power Index is not just about the rankings. There's also a brilliant report attached to it that goes into a lot of these questions in detail. You can look them up both at power.loweinstitute.org. So look it up, dive in, um, and please enjoy the 2023 Lowy Institute Asia Power Index. Thank you. Thank you.